Would you please turn with me to your study outline? And uh, as you're turning in that, let me welcome those of you that are joining us online. We are so glad that you're joining us for our study of God's Word, as well as our friends at Baptist Community Church in Arco, Idaho, and also our friends at Purpose Church in Kalispell, Montana. We are so glad that you are joining us for our study as well. We're continuing a series called Love Like That. Five Relationship Secrets from Jesus, Learning to Love Other People Like Jesus Loves Us. So five relationship secrets from Jesus that we can copy as we follow him, and it'll strengthen us in our relationships with each other. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus was mindful and how we need to be mindful. And then last Sunday, we talked about how Jesus was approachable and how we need to be approachable. And now today, we're going to talk about how Jesus was graceful. Uh, He was full of grace. And this is like perfect how it all lined up in this series. We didn't plan it this way. It just happened that way. That grace was the thing we were going to be talking about on Mother's Day. How perfect is that? Uh, I know that sometimes your relationship with your mom can be a complicated thing, but for the most part, most of us would say the person in our lives that gave us the most grace growing up was our mother. I was just talking to somebody afterwards, and they work with uh, people in this uh, challenged youth uh, program where they've been in trouble with the law and work with them, and they said on, uh, they always uh, have them write a note to somebody they want to thank in their life, and he says 100% of the time, it is their mother. That's the one that they want to make the card for, and it's just something about our moms that they love us regardless. You've heard the old phrase or, or saying, uh, that's, a mother, that's a face only a mother could love. You ever hear that, you know? And sometimes it's like, uh, that's a behavior that only a mother could love you after doing. Uh, that's, uh, that's something you said that only your mother could love you after uh, saying that. Who gave you great, more grace growing up than your mother? I love this quote by Abraham Lincoln. He said, no man is poor, and Abraham Lincoln grew up poor. No man is poor who has a godly mother. Anybody want to say amen to that? Now, we love our mothers because they gave, they gave us what psychologists refer to, uh, the fancy psychological term, is unconditional positive regard. Okay, put that on your Mother's Day card. Dear mom, thank you so much for your unconditional positive regard. Uh, that's what psychologists call it. It's love for a person regardless of what they've done. Uh, It separates the behaviors of a person uh, from that person in order to offer up to them an attitude of grace. Uh, Let me give you a definition of three words. Uh, First of all is justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And then grace is getting what you could never earn or deserve. Uh, Last Sunday, uh, we talked about the prodigal son, or actually it was in a video clip that I used where Jesus was teaching on the prodigal son. And I love this quote by Max Licato. He said, mercy gave the prodigal son a second chance. Grace gave him a feast. So mercy gave him a second chance. Grace gave him a feast. Les Parrott writes, grace is by definition unfair. It doesn't make sense. And that's just the point. If you want to love like Jesus, you can't limit your love to people who deserve it. See, anybody can love people that deserve it. Uh, When you love like Jesus, that's when you love people uh, that don't deserve it. So we want to first of all talk about the grace giving of Jesus. I love this story uh, that John, one of the four biographers of the life of Jesus, uh, that he told this story about Jesus. Uh, He said, at dawn, he, Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman. Now, where's the guy? They only bring in the woman. It takes two to commit adultery, last time I checked, all right? They bring in the woman. They don't bring in the guy. Brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. Can you imagine how awful and humiliating that would be? And said to Jesus, teacher, this woman, don't don't even use her name, This woman was caught in the act of adultery. These teachers of the law, these Pharisees, these really pastors had like no grace at all. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, 
Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Now there's only one left that could condemn her because he was without sin, and that was Jesus. But he chooses not to condemn her. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now that's important, that last phrase. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus is basically telling her, I could condemn you, but I'm not going to. Because I want something better for you. But you've got to stop living your life that way because it's not the best I have for you. God doesn't say, you know, change our ways, move in a different direction just because he's kind of like bossing us around or he just kind of wants us to do it his way. He does it for our own good because that's what's best for her. Her old life was not working for her. And so he says, I don't condemn you. I give you grace. But now go and change the direction of your life. Go now and leave your life of sin. That doesn't mean she never sinned again. Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect for the rest of your life. But it does mean you change the direction of your life to try to please God in a way that's in, in the middle of his will rather than running away from it. Uh, Walter Trobish writes, Christ accepts us as we are, but when he accepts us, we cannot remain as we are. Now forgive me, I got like, like a bunch of quotes I'm using, because there are like so many awesome things that people have said about grace that I just couldn't stop myself. And so I'm going to share every last one of them with you. Here we go. Anne Lamott. I love this quote by Anne Lamott. I do not at all understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. I like that. Flannery O'Connor. Uh, she wrote, all of human nature vigorously resists grace because grace changes us and the change is painful. I love this paraphrase of Proverbs 11, verse 27. Anyone can find the dirt in someone. Be the one who finds the gold. Isn't that what we love about Jesus? Is he looks beyond the dirt of our life and he finds the gold. Jesus looks beyond the mess of our life. He looks beyond our mistakes and beyond our flaws and, and he finds the goal. And so Jesus said, if you want to love Mike like me, if you want to follow in my footsteps, be gold prospectors. That's what, that's what Christians are supposed to be. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be looking for gold in people. We're supposed to be looking beyond the dirt and the mess and be the one, like God was the one that found the gold in us, be the one that finds uh, the gold uh, in, in other people. Uh, Helmut Tillich uh, writes, Jesus did not identify uh, the person with his sin. By the way, is he not the coolest theologian ever with his cigar right there, man, you know? <laughs> I'm just thinking if I had one of those up here, how much cooler would I be as a pastor, you know? So, uh, Jesus did not identify the person with his sin, but rather saw in his sin something alien, something that really did not belong to him, something from which he would free him and bring him back to his real self. That's what grace does. It brings us back to who, our real self, to who we were meant to be. A grace is God's unmerited favor, an undeserved and unconditional gift. Grace is mentioned over a hundred times in just the New Testament. Okay, just, just the, the last 27 books of the Bible, what we call the New Testament, the story of Jesus and, and the followers of Jesus and the teachings of the followers of Jesus. It's mentioned over a hundred times, over and over again. It's one of the words most used in, in the Bible, grace, grace. Uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, this is how we get right with God. For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 1 John 4, 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. I love this quote by Philip Yancey. He says, while every other religion offers a way to earn approval, okay, every world philosophy, every religion in the world, every pathway it's all about earning God's approval, okay? If I, if I do this list of do's, if I avoid this list of don'ts, if I chant in a certain way, if I meditate in a certain way, if I follow these religious rituals, if I do all this stuff, then maybe, just maybe, I will earn God's approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. It is a 
gift. And everybody here, if you're watching online or you're listening later by podcast, this is a gift. He's standing here with a Mother's Day gift to you, okay? Even if you're not a mother, even if you're not a woman, if you're a guy, he's, hand, he's standing here on Mother's Day. He wants to give you a Mother's Day gift. Let's go back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, this not from your own effort, from yourselves. It's a gift of God. And right now, all you have to do is in your heart, just simply say, God, I receive this gift. Right now, if you're watching online or later on by podcast, just say, God, I want to receive your gift. Now, if, you want, if you're here and you want more details on this, right in front of you there in the book rack is something that says how to become a follower of Jesus. And just take this home with you. Just take it right out of the book rack and take it home with you. And it's got three steps to, to following God. Admit our condition before God. God, I need somebody to forgive me. Believe that Jesus is, God, is the answer to my problem. And number three, choose to follow Christ. And there's a little suggested prayer there. But it doesn't even have to be this elaborate. And nothing magical in the wording of that prayer. Just simply the cry of the heart. Um, I receive. God, right now, I just want to receive the free gift that you offer to me. Just that in your heart. And you can right now, today, receive the grace, the gift of God. Uh, just be you. Just be you uh, and he will accept you as you are. He'll begin to change you and work in your life. But, but he accepts you. He loves you. Just be you, and God is going to take care of the rest. Okay, let's pivot for the remaining time that we have from receiving God's grace to giving God's grace. Okay? And if you turn to the second page of your study outline, at the bottom there's a little bit of a, I don't know, quiz, not so much a test or anything like that, but just kind of something to see what areas do we need to work on in this. You score yourself 1 to 10, see how it scores on 1 to 100. Just kind of see what areas uh, are, are you working with. Kimberly and I were going over this uh, last night, and just kind of like talking to each other about where we see we can grow you know, in, in these areas. Uh, number one, I don't focus on having other people earn my respect I just, I just give it to them. Number two, I stay completely clear of criticizing others and fault finding. Uh, number three, like Jesus, I separate the sin from the sinner. Number four, I give love, respect, and appreciation freely to people who don't deserve it. Number five, people who know me well would describe me as a grace giver. Number six, I know God loves me unconditionally. Number seven, when I see someone acting in a way I don't like, I'm inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt until I better understand the situation. Number eight, I feel God's love in my life and know I receive it even when I don't deserve it. Number nine, I'm more inclined to have an open heart than an accusing finger. And number 10, I believe the best about people, even if they've been bad, I want the best for them. Could we hold it there for just a moment? That was the one that really convicted me. When, when I see somebody doing something bad, I want them to reap what they've sown. Unless it's me. I don't, I don't want me to reap what I've sown. I just want other people. And that really convicted me. I believe the best about people. And even if they've been bad, I, want, I still want the best uh, for them. Now, what keeps us from being grace givers? One word, judgmentalism. Judgmentalism. Now, most people think that other people are judgmental, but that they themselves are not judgmental. How many of you know a judgmental person? Let me, let me just see your hand. Okay. Most of us think that other people are judgmental. Uh, we just don't think that we ourselves are judgmental. We're kind of like, I'm dating myself a little bit, but anybody remember Garrison Keeler's Lake Wobegon, where all the children are above average? All the children are above average. We all, we all think that we're above average when it comes to being judgmental. Les Parrott writes, social scientists at Cornell University did research testing people's competency levels, and they concluded their study by saying, this is the conclusion of years of research and a lot of money, incompetent people don't know that they're incompetent. I just, that's just like fantastic, isn't it? You know, just, uh, yeah. incompetent people don't know they're incompetent. And if you apply it to being judgmental, Judgmental people, we're judgmental without it being conscious of it. A judgmental people don't realize that they're judgmental. And then Les Parrott gives some examples. Here's some examples. 
Why can't that mother control her unruly kids? Why can't that mother control her unruly kids? Unconsciously, we're saying, I wish I was a better mom. And when I judge this woman who appears to be struggling, I feel better about myself. Here's another example. That guy is constantly smiling. It's so obnoxious and phony. (laughs) Unconsciously, I'm saying to myself, I wish I was a happier person. But since I'm not, I may feel better by judging him to be a fraud. Here's another thing people think. Uh, What a bunch of angry losers out there protesting in the streets. They need to get a job. Unconsciously, I'm saying, their conviction and activism scares me. But by calling them lazy, I feel morally superior. Now, social scientists call this negativity bias. That's the fancy word for it. The rest of us and Jesus call it judgmentalism. I love this quote, and I wish I'd put it in your study notes, by Terry Cooper. He writes, we need other people's faults in order to dodge our own. We need other people's faults in order to dodge our own. Now, here's how Jesus talked about it. In Matthew, who is one of the biographers of the life of Jesus, here's what he recorded Jesus saying. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, real important here. The rest of the Bible talks about the need for us to challenge each other, hold each other accountable, um, um, encourage each other in the right direction. And so it's not saying that we should never judge between right and wrong. But what Jesus is talking about here is the attitude in which we judge. Do we do it with a sense of our own failings, an awareness of our own flaws? Do we do it with a sense of humility, or do we do it with arrogance or hypocrisy? He says in verse 2, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now let's just hold that there for just a moment. After we have taken the plank out of our own eye, after we've humbled ourselves, then it's healthy to help each other remove the specks from each other's eyes. We're supposed to challenge each other and even confront each other. We have a saying here at Purpose Church, your blind spots will rule you. You all know my failures and my flaws. You, you, You know them, but I just can't see them. They're over here in my blind spot. You can see them, but I can't. And so if we can help each other get the specks out of our own eyes and overcome our blind spots, as long as we do it with the right attitude, and that attitude is humility. I love this quote by Byron Langenfeld. He says, rare is the person who can weigh the faults of others without putting his thumb on the scales. Isn't that a great line? Rare is the person who can weigh the faults of others without putting his thumb on the scales. Uh, My wife, Kimberly, she does this to me all the time, and I'm so stupid I keep falling for the same trick over and over again. But when I'm standing on, on, the, on the bathroom scale and I'll be standing on there and, and, and looking carefully at the number there, she'll sneak up behind me and put her foot on the scale. <laughs> and I'll be like, oh my goodness, you know, she can put like another 20 or 30 pounds on. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not happy with what I saw before she did that either. <laughs> I mean, I'm not delusional here, all right? Hey, that's awesome. Yeah, you know. But, but it's even worse when she kind of puts the, the, the foot on the scale. And she does that to me over and over, and I fall for it every time. Uh, and so we're not to put our thumb on the scale to make it worse than it actually is. Now, what Jesus taught us about giving grace. And in, in Matthew 20, he tells this story. And there are three main points to this story. Number one, Jesus wants a lot of people working in his vineyard. This guy goes back for more workers five different times. Number two, the main point of the story is Jesus shares his grace extravagantly. And then number three, Jesus is an includer, not an excluder. Uh, We pick it up with verse one. For the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius. That's how much you get paid for a day's work. That's how much it took for a family to survive uh, is a denarius. They could survive eating for a day. So he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw the others. Okay, so he picks up some at six in the morning. Their work day went six in the morning till six at night, and they basically lived hand to mouth. 
work for a day, get enough to eat for that day, go the next day, work for a day at Denarius, and eat for a day. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, that's like an hour from quitting time, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius, a full day's salary for only an hour's work. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Some Bible scholars say this shouldn't be called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. It should be called the parable of the gracious and generous landowner. Uh, Jesus here, there's usually one point per parable. They don't have a bunch of points. They usually have just one. And Jesus is not teaching a lesson here on economics. Uh, this isn't about fair labor practices, okay? This story is about grace. Uh, the guys hired last couldn't survive on one-twelfth of a day's salary. They couldn't survive on that. And so mercifully, uh, the landowner, because he was so generous, gave them what they needed. And it's the same with us. God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we need. And, what, and, 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 and so he gives us what we need, and he calls on us to give other people what they need. And what other people need is for us to value them and to forgive them. That's the main thing people need from us if we're going to be like Jesus. We, they need us to value them, and they need us to forgive them. Let me ask you a question. How many of you want this $5 bill? Let me see your hand. Raise your hand if you want this $5. Who, who wants this $5 bill? Okay, good. All right, we're going to give this to you in here in just a second. Um, okay, uh, let me ask you a question. I'm going to crumple it up like that. Crumple it up good. How many still want the, the $5 bill? Okay, yeah, still want the $5 bill. And I'm going to put it on the ground. I'm going to step on it, make it dirty. How many still want the $5 bill? Hey, come up here. Get your $5 bill. Okay, why do you still want it? Because, because it still has value. Buy your mother a Mother's Day gift of that, okay? Take, take her out to lunch, like Pomona Valley Mining Company. That'll have a cover that, you know, you do that. Uh, it still has value, even if it's been crumpled, even if it's been beaten up. And the same thing is true with people. People still have value, even if they've been stepped on in life, even if they've been beaten up in life. Even if they've been beaten down by the stuff of life, they still have value. We still have value in God's eyes, and we're to see other people as having value uh, as well. So they need us to value them. And number two, we need to forgive them. I love this story about Clara Barton, who is the founder of the uh, Red Cross. Uh, she was talking with a friend one day when the person, the name of a person they both knew came up. Years before that person had treated Clara in like a terribly unkind way. And so the friend asked Clara Barton, don't you remember when she did that to you? No, Barton replied, I distinctly remember forgetting that. I distinctly remember forgetting that. Now, here's my final point and then we're done. How to be a better grace giver. And, and this, is, this is unusual. I'd never thought about that this till we. The key to being a better grace giver is one word, curiosity. Curiosity is the one word for how to be a better grace giver. He's like, what are you talking about, Glenn? Albert Einstein said, curiosity has its own reason for existing. And I read this anonymously from somebody this past week, and it just, it was just awesome. Almost every evaluation we make of others arises from incomplete information. 
We fill in the gaps of what we don't know with preconceived judgments. Curiosity, however, keeps our judgments at bay. I never thought of curiosity as the antidote to judgmentalism. It opens our mind to the possibility that there is something about the situation we don't fully understand. When you see someone that you think is acting insane, stupid, or worse, this is the question. I wonder what's going on with that person that I don't know about. Curiosity. Picture this. You're riding on a crowded bus going through the city, minding your own business. You notice a dad and his two small children board the bus and sit down. The kids are a nightmare, jumping up on people, making loud noises, and the dad seems totally oblivious. After a while, you can take it no longer. and You say, sir, will you please attend to your kids? They are just so out of, out of control. The dad then seems to come out of his oblivion and says to you, I'm so sorry, I just didn't notice. You see, we just came from the hospital, and my wife, their mom, just passed away. I guess I'm kind of numb. Now, what just happened? You just went from being judgmental to compassionate. Why? You just got all the information. William Shakespeare says, O momentary grace of mortal men, which we more hunt for than the grace of God. Fyodor Dostoevsky said, To love a person means to see him as God intended him to be. Now, how are we going to do that this week? Here, here's our three steps to being more graceful this coming week. Number one, determine to get the rest of the story before acting impulsively or judgmentally. Number two, talk with God about areas in your life where you react in judgment and not grace. And then number three, make a list of three grace-filled actions that you will implement this week.